I stand in awe here before you, hardly able to believe what I see. The collective gathering of so many different Jews, which is the most complicated thing of all, to get many different Jews of different opinions in one room, but of all different walks of life. So I thank you all on behalf of the Algemeen, on behalf of all of you here. There's one of the most heartbreaking but poignant stories of the Holocaust. A particular vicious, savage Nazi was about to shoot an unfortunate Jew. And the Jew asked the Nazi, may I say something before you kill me? Of course, dismissively. And the Jew silently began to whisper. He began to whisper. As the Nazis watching him whisper, he says, what are you saying? He says, I'm saying thank you. He said, who are you thanking, you miserable Jew? Look at you, you're about to be killed. He says, I'm thanking my God. Where's your God? He's forsaken you. What are you thanking him for? And he responded quietly. I'm thanking him for not creating me like you. I stand here not as a publisher of a paper, but as a simple Jew speaking to you heart to heart, soul to soul. Because when my father passed away eight years ago, I had full time work more than full time, and I really assumed the responsibility simply as a mitzvah. Because I felt a voice that has influence cannot die. I was trained and taught that nothing dies in this world that's good. And if you're not ready to fight for it, it's not worth living actually. One of the most, perhaps best moment, finest moment in journalism that captures the essence of what it means to be a journalist, what it means to be a writer, is, of all people, Emil Zola, in the 18, late 1800s, after the Dreyfus Affair, in the famous headline, Jacques Hughes, I accuse the French government for complicity in the blood libel of blaming Dreyfus for traitor, which someone else did it. And not only was he stand up at great risk to himself, but he actually prevailed. This is journalism at its best. Today we have our own battles, different types of battles. Today actually it's not always a battle against evil, sometimes it's a battle to express a vision. You know they tell that joke in the Knesset, someone got up and said, I have a solution to all our problems, a novel solution, instead of fighting with our Arab neighbors, let's attack the United States of America. Yeah, it sounds weird, but listen to his brilliant idea. And of course they'll beat us, and then out of guilt they'll rebuild us like they did Japan and Germany after World War II, and we'll become an even greater superpower. Well, old little Id, old little Jews sitting in the back of the room says, a very nice idea, but what happens if we win? So it's one thing, as Jews, we know how to play defense, we know how to protect underdogs, we survived everything. But it's a whole different story to know what you stand for, what is our vision for the future. And I believe the Algemeiner also tries to capture that battle. I mentioned my father. There are two people in my life that stand out as real warriors. One born in Moscow, in the throes of Stalinist Russia. Another born in Siget, came out of the hells of Auschwitz. And their lives intersected. They met as journalists, as writers and friends, and the relationship continues. One of them is watching us from heaven. That's my dear father, passed away eight years ago. Sure, Shepping Nachas. And the other, Yibod Lechaim, for many healthy years, together with his beautiful wife, 
Professor Elie Wiesel. Friends, and that friendship has continued, extended to me. Professor Wiesel honors me with that continued friendship and he's here to honor us as well. Both warriors, we say by Jews, we don't fight with swords, with spirit. When we're bitter, when something hurts us, we take a pen. When we suffer, we provide an insight. When we endure maybe the most difficult and unbearable, we become greater moral voices. Professor Wiesel captures and epitomizes that. With all the anguish. No one can only, it's not even describable. And yet, to have the fortitude to continue to be that moral voice, a warrior for truth, a warrior for what matters for justice, and not always when it's comfortable and popular. <laughs> Talking about fathers, I'd like to be personal a bit to Harvey, though we not met till this evening, but I was deeply moved. You know, Harvey has a reputation as a tough guy. Hollywood is Hollywood. We all have our perspectives on that. But it's something you may not know. Miramax, founded by Harvey and his brother Bob, is an acronym of their parents, Miriam and Max Weinstein. Now, tell me, what does it take for a person who's in that so-called glitzy world to name studio after their parents? To me, that captures a heart, and I think the essence of what this evening is about, that despite all the machinations and all the defense mechanisms and all the power we may project, at the end of the day, we're all simple children. And Harvey has dedicated his life to telling stories, and successfully so. And as I heard in one of his interviews, he doesn't listen to a pitch. He wants to read a script. He wants to hear the whole story. He doesn't want to hear a sales pitch. So despite our differences, I think we stand here tonight, we sit here tonight with innocence. And we remember and we honor our parents. We honor generations past. We never forget that those are the seeds that shape us who we are today. And to be able to capture that in the media world, in a digital world, I think is a revolution. Because you don't hear about the internet or the media with a heart and a soul. You hear it as a machine. It's an efficiency. Look how people texting, no one here of sure, texting each other instead of having conversations. I was sitting in a car with someone, trying to get his attention. I see he's texting, texting, so I sent him a text message. <laughs> he says to me, are you sitting right near me? Why are you texting me? He says, because I can't get your attention. So we're here to celebrate soul. And we're here to celebrate the spirit that transcends our differences, and especially the ability to tell the story. With authentic words from the heart that enter the heart. So I am distinctly honored to introduce actually two individuals, but we'll do it in this order. First, Mr. Harvey Weinstein, founder of Miramax, today of the Weinstein, to present an award, a special award, to Professor Eli Wiesel. So please join me in welcoming Mr. Harvey Weinstein. My mother, the Miriam of Miramax, um, I think of all the many things you know, that we've been involved in, was so thrilled when she heard that I was presenting to Professor Wiesel. And um, she, like all of us, have been touched by his incredible work and his incredible humanity. And I'm happy to be here on the Algenheimer's 40th anniversary and to celebrate their top 100. And tonight, ironically, is a, a night for um, Time Magazine also has their 100. And um, I'm sure the party isn't as good. And I, one thing, I, can, I never knew a place like Gustavino's could have potato latkes that good. Um, just to be in a room hearing Professor Weisel speak is incredible enough, but to be here only a few weeks after Yom HaShoah and sharing the stage with a professor is hard to describe. He embodies what is truly best about humanity, 
He was one of the first people to recount his experiences in night and the impression and the story that he told and that he continues to tell has impressed so many millions. And I think there would be no Schindler's List, no Life is Beautiful, no Reader. You know what I mean? So many of the movies that, you know, us in the industry have been involved in, I mean, you know, about the Holocaust came from that first seminal book, which was Night, which continues to inspire me. And I will tell you that I read it two or three different times as recently as a couple of years ago. Um, I know that Eli Wiesel is beloved by leaders. I met George Bush uh, with <laughs> George Bush 43, and he told me of his great affection for uh, Professor Wiesel, so did Bill Clinton, so did Barack Obama, and so have many of the presidents of the United States and so many world leaders. I can't tell you what an incredible honor it is to give Eli Wiesel the Warrior of Truth recipient because he truly is the great Warrior of Truth for our time, Professor Wiesel. My dear Simon and dear Harvey, I have obviously many friends here. My rabbi, Kermeyer, so many. I won't name Alain Dershowitz, of course. And it's a pleasure to be always with them. But to be honored in that way is very special. Why is it so special? First, because I used to be a journalist. When I came to America, I was a journalist. For some 25 years, I worked for Yediot Achanot in Israel and the Jewish Daily Forward. At that time, there were so many Yiddish dailies all over the world. And today, there isn't a single one. A weekly here and there, and the Algemeine, both in Yiddish and English. But something of the journalist remained in me, which means I want to know what's happening. I want to know what is the destiny of the Jewish people today. As a journalist for Israeli papers at that time, I couldn't file anything unless it had something to do with Israel or the Jews. And I was looking and looking and finding, trying to find them daily cable. Today, you cannot open a newspaper without having stories on Israel and the Jewish people on three, four pages every day. So I'm a little bit envious of today's journalists. They don't have to work that hard. I did. Now, Harvey, I'm grateful to you for your words. We have met many times. I write books and you make films. But it's so extraordinary that you made me love films. It's only thanks to you. I, really, I was not part of films. My life was books, writing or reading and teaching. I have been teaching for some, over more than 40 years. And I've never given the same course twice because I'm a student before being a teacher. I'm, a, I'm in my classes, I'm the best student, not the best teacher. But you know, for you, because at one point uh, you came and, and in my life, and now I like films too, especially those that you make, naturally. I'll tell you a Hasidic story after I come from a Hasidic background. And the story is apparently a true story. I found it in, in, in the Hasidic book of those times. A Jew came to uh, his rabbi, I think it was the rabbi of Gur, or, and said, Admor, I, I have a terrible problem. I'm forgetful. I am so forgetful 
that in the morning when I get up, I don't know where I put my clothes. What can I do? He thought he would get a blessing. The rabbi gave me an advice. Why don't you write it down? Before you go to sleep, you write, you put it, your, your uh, jacket here, your shoes there. Here he did. So he wrote, my shoes are under the chair, my pants are uh, on another chair, my jacket, everything, and I am in bed. Perfect. Next day he got up, found the chair, found the shoes, found the jacket, and, he always, and then he said, I am in bed, but the bed was empty. He was busy writing. So he said, where am I? And he came to the rabbi and he said, Rabbi, I found everything, but where am I? But isn't that true of all of us? Where are we in the world? What are we doing in creation? And these questions, of course, that have to do not only with philosophy, with metaphysics, it has to do with history. It's very simple. I read because I want to learn. And the more I learn, more que the more questions I have. You mentioned the story, Shimon, of that tragedy. I read, I believe, every single book that appears in languages that are available to me, and I speak at least four, five, six languages. And to this day, I can tell you, I still don't know really. I know how it happened. I don't know why. I just don't know why. Why did it happen? Of course, a believer says, naturally, where was the rabbinical element? Where was God? The non-believer has no questions. I don't envy him because I love questions. But the fact is that now what we do, we Jews, what we do, we believe that it is our place in Jewish history naturally to be together with other Jews, naturally to remain Jewish, and naturally to do whatever we can for the state of Israel. <clears throat> when you study Jewish history, you realize that Jewish people have never been together, actually. They always quarreled. Uh, a true story, I read it. When the Americans occupied Kabul, they found two Jews there. And they didn't talk to each other. <laughs> and they had even two synagogues, they didn't go to each other. In Kabul, two Jews. But that is true all the time. Read the Bible. You know, I feel so sorry for Moshe Rabbeinu, for our, our teacher Moses. So, what they have done to him, he, you know, once, in my class, I had a great teacher, Shaul Lieberman, who was, for 17 years, he was my teacher. And once he asked, who is the most tragic character in the Bible? I said, Adam, to be the only man, the lonely man. Uh, Abraham, in order to kill his son. Isaac, who almost died on the altar. He said, no, 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 no. I said, who? He said, God. God is the most tragic character because he looks down and said, what I gave you such a beautiful world. What are you doing with it? And the same thing is with the Jewish people. Study Jewish history, there wasn't a century where we were not persecuted. But somehow we managed to survive. We managed to survive, whereas all the empires that persecuted the Jews disappeared. The last one was actually not Spain, but the Soviet Union. When Stalin became a Semitic, it was the end of an era for, for Russia. What does it all mean? My Kamashmanal, what does it all mean that we are doing? I'll tell you, I'll read to you something, a kind of credo, which is mine. It's okay. Thank you. As a Jew, I believe that I can and must express my being part of humanity only through my Jewishness. 
My Jewish experiences are rooted first in the memory of my people and then in the history of all people. What I say as a Jew, a Catholic or a Protestant or a Buddhist or an agnostic could perhaps say about their religious affiliations or ethnic origin. One is neither superior nor inferior than another. As such, I consider that all that <clears throat> acquire by myself and by others who deal with words or pictures or art needs to be endowed with an ethical dimension. I have written and published, I think, some 60 books. And I hope that every one of them has this emphasis on ethos, on morality. I believe that one must not estrange oneself from either one or the other, although I believe that I belong to a traumatized generation that often felt abandoned by God and betrayed by mankind. And yet, we cling to both. Was it yesterday or eternities ago that some of us have realized that human beings are capable of unspeakable brutality? That for killers it was human to be inhuman? Are we then to give up on humanity? What is it about creation? Is man God's victim or prisoner? Or is he his failure? What can we say about our place and our destiny? What can we say simply to explain and to express our profound attachment to our ancestors, to Abraham and Isaac and Jacob and Moses and all those who actually are the beginning of our own life. I believe that every day it is incumbent upon us to choose a new between deadly warfare among adults and the right of children to grow up without fear, with a smile on their face, between ugly hatred and the nobility of opposing it, between inflicting pain and humiliation and inventing a beginning of solidarity and hope to our people, but then to all people. Not to choose is also a choice, said Albert Camus, the wrong choice. I know and I speak of experience that even in the midst of darkness, it is possible to create light and share warmth with one another. That even on the edge of the abyss, it is possible to dream exalted dreams of compassion that it is possible to be free and strengthen the ideal of freedom even within prison walls, that even in exile, friendship becomes an anchor. One minute before one dies, there may be hope in his or her heart. One minute before one dies, he or she is still immortal. In the final analysis, I believe in man in spite of man, I still believe in his or her future, in spite of what human beings have done to the principle of human dignity when they have done to my people, our people. I still believe in language, although it has been distorted, corrupted, and poisoned by the enemy. I still cling to words, for it is we who decide whether they become spears or balm carriers of bigotry or vehicles of understanding, whether they are used to curse or to heal, whether they are in here to cause shame, on the contrary, to give comfort. In school or in the laboratory, it is incumbent upon us to turn information into knowledge, knowledge into sensitivity, and sensitivity into commitment. Ultimately, it is we who decide whether words are to be turned into poisonous arrows or into peace offerings. 
whether they will move us to heresy or to faith. I belong to a generation. The Jew in me belongs to that generation that has learned that whatever the question, despair is not an answer. Strangely enough, we sang the anthem and whenever I hear and sing the anthem, I moved to tears. Old law of Tartikwatenu. And I was trying to understand and to research where, why did anyone believe that we have Tartikwatenu? So I went back to the sources. And I found actually in the book of Ezekiel, and he says there, Avda, the Ziknei Israel, the eldest of Zion, of, said, Avda, Tikvateru, everything was lost, our hope too. Came Imba, the Yiddish and Jewish poet in New York, who wrote, Ode Lo Avda, Tikvateru. No, our hope has not been lost. And hope is actually what keeps us who we are. I believe one can live without love but not without hope. So, I believe therefore, that whatever the experience, the experience must bring hope and must involve us and move us to action, for indifference is never an option when people suffer. We have suffered enough throughout the centuries and surely in the 20th century when too many people were indifferent. Such is the wonder of art, of literature, of friendship. And I have learned that from my tradition, my people in exile, that a tale of indifference breaks down its icy armor and the tale of despair emerges as a tale against despair. So we Jews can, I believe, teach humanity certain lessons which are absolutely indispensable to anyone who still believes that humanity has a chance not only of survival, but of survival with honor. To all of you, my friends, and of course again Harvey, and your Shimon, your family. I thank you because, because, thank you.